Okay, good morning. Um, sorry for the delay in the next series of videos, and this one will probably require me to jump off at some point. Um, if you hear something in the background, that is the movie Up. Um, my son is watching it, so hopefully we'll get some through some content here. Um, so one of the things, too, we've been talking about with this poem uh, that I've been taking my notes on right here is um, thinking about how can I write about this whole book, right? How do I do that from looking at one poem? How can I make an argument? And my suggestion is to take sections of poems um, from different parts of the book that it kind of give you an amalgamation of what the book's doing. And you can close read those, right, in a paper. And just the argument of the paper is you're not looking at just one poem. You're looking at repeated whatever, right? Repeated themes, repeated language, repeated imagery, um, repeated uh, association that he makes throughout the text. So what we're doing when we take these notes, it isn't just about being able to close read this one poem. It's about thinking as we read forward in the book, what other language stands out to us and how do we start seeing that this thing is threaded. We've had a lot of information included in this already. Um, so we're just going to try to finish the poem as best we can. So we've had these movements go up to this point. We've talked about these in all the videos. Um, follow through with these as you can. And we switch over here to the last half of the poem, OK? You are tending not only to me, you tell me. So notice this. We've got the longest line in the, in, the, uh, in the piece so far. So a lot of information happening in this one. And the word tending, is I'm writing that one down, uh, is, is really important. Uh, it's a specific word. Um, one of the things. I'm going to look at is the etymology of this word and by that I mean the history of the word the etymology um, because it's a really specific word like I think about tendency and tenderness um, so I'm kind of curious what the root of this word is maybe there's something fun in that uh, and I can cite that using the Oxford English Dictionary or the OED which I'm happy to show you how to use in a different video if you have interest in that one just email me and let me know okay so you are tending not only to me you tell me okay so now we're getting language directly from, actually indirectly from our second person, but being told to us by our speaker. So the person says, you're attending not only to me, but to your other child, M dash, we call this an M dash, E-M space D-A-S-H, M dash. Um, so what an M dash does, what this particular thing here does grammatically, is it slides us into the next thought. So it's as if in the middle of a thought, we have a sudden shift into, you know, you think about like a, like an acceleration into something else. So instead of it being like back, back to back um, like that, there's a, there's a slight pause, a consideration, and then we move forward into a new idea, um, often a tangent from the original idea. So it's related to it grammatically, but not necessarily exactly. So it's a movement. Um, so kind of the opposite of an ellipses in a way, like an ellipses, like three periods in a row, that suggests an elongated pause. And typically when we see that, we see it a lot in drama and theater, um, if, you, if you look at those, and it suggests these like contemplative spaces to think and like come up with your next response. Where an M dash is, is somewhat more about like having a sudden idea and wanting to express the suddenness of that. So this is suddenness here. It's my kid. You're attending not only to me, you tell me, but to your other child, the heir. And the, sen the sentence goes on through the stanza. But you know, this is important. Other child is important because all of a sudden, this, right, makes the me here the, uh, the other child of this other child. Um, so, you know, the nature of the relationship is, is quite different, right? Um, it really suggests more of a maternal instinct here, and maybe there's some crossing of wires in this space. Um, to imagine if this is an intimate relationship, which I, I, I feel that it is, I feel that it is. I don't get a, um, a maternal or a paternal uh, reality between these. I find that this is more as if someone has had to change the obligation or the nature of the relationship. You're tending not only to me, you tell me, um, but to your other child, the air, and air puts his feet in my slippers, and air scrubs his teeth on my brush, and we must learn to share a bed, we must learn to share a body. So our sentence now is the longest one we've had. It's three stanzas long, six total lines, and it's the content is basically saying that the person that they're, they're with, the you, has told them that, that you tend to me, Right? You tend to me, 
but you also need to tend to this other child um, and it's the air and you know air puts his feet in my slippers which is a very domestic issue remember we go back to the image of the bed right so this is a very domestic issue it's, it's a it's an image of slippers it's comfort um well you know i don't know what else right it, it's like more of like a oh gosh like a, like a like a like a private thing right i don't wear my slippers out I mean, when i want my dogs i do but and they're also very specific to me my slippers right they're like that's not like a part of my identity but I'm very comfortable with him just being mine. I can only share my slippers, right? Because this other child does, the heir um, does this one, and it scrubs his teeth on my brush, okay? And then that scrubbing of teeth isn't always the way I use that particular phrase, but there's a real cleanliness in scrubs. It's a very, uh, it's a medicinal image for me, of somebody, a doctor image of somebody wearing scrubs, his teeth on my brush, but and also an image of cleanliness, right? Of, of taking care of oneself, a uh, very basic domestic issues, um, and then we must learn to share a bed. We must learn to share a body. So uh, we must learn to share a, right, are all repeated. So basically these two lines are almost identical except for the phrase, you know, and bed body, um, right? So this whole sentence is, is very simple uh, in, in its gestures and its imagery. So he's using a lot of simplicity in this regard as we've seen, but the image itself of course is not literal. Um, there is not, this isn't literal in a way of like exact, exact to this is again a kind of personification as we saw with the springs. And now the other, the you is doing the personification. And in this space, what we can see is, I think the way I read this is, the you is basically saying, I have to both take care of this person who's in front of me like this, I have to tend to this person who is ill and difficult and, you know, dying. And I have to tend to this in a very real sense, but I'm also at all times, right? The you of the poem is all times must tend to the reality that this person will in short time become heir. And in that way, this person, the person who is sick, the, the speaker of this poem is both simultaneously here and not here. Um, which again reminds me of Buddhism quite a bit, but this idea that the knowledge of his death, the knowledge of his impending death, and when you read his bio, you know that this is when the cancer came back, much, much, uh, much more vicious the second time, much more aggressive. And of course, that's a research area too, right? I mean, to learn a little bit more about Ewing's sarcoma will help us understand these poems and its, you know, and its rate um, and how it operates. Um, so this person who is here is incredibly aware of not being here. They're both aware of not being here. This is part of the difficulty of their relationship. And part of the difficulty for the you in the poem is that they must tend to, uh, to the person who is here and to the person who is already not going to be here anymore. And that's happening right now. And of course, after the death, then that will also be a part of it. But right now, they have to learn to share a bed. They have to learn to share a body, right? The we, of, the, of this here to me is a little different than the, than the you and the I of the previous. This is to me is the we, the me and the heir, right? The, her, her two, or his, I'm sorry, their two children. I don't mean to gender that every time. Um, I think he had a wife, uh, pretty sure, but I don't mean to gender that. That's unfair of me. Um, that's my kid again. So uh, we must learn to share a bed, we must learn to share a body. And it's actually like a pretty, uh, it's a pretty positive, I would say, um, Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Pretty positive ending here. Um, you know, the word must really stands out to me. There's, there's a sort of necessity built into that, like a requirement for health and safety. Um, like it just feels pressing. We must do this, not we need to, but we must is a different kind of word. But generally speaking, generally speaking, I don't know if y'all can hear that or not, but generally speaking, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's very much showing us that they have a connection here in this sentence that um, is complicated and it involves not really existing and being aware of that. When we come back here to living it up, this is an idea to me that suggests that, you know, there isn't really uh, much he can do. So he has to be present in this death. He has to be present and share this life with, this, with, with his death, with the, with the heir that he will become and the memory of him. And I think there's a fun play here on air, A-I-R, against the word air, H-E-I-R, 
um, in this sort of space of like in a relationship, the if if the, if if to have a child becomes something in that, of course, that won't be possible for him as he as he will be passed. He'll be dead by then. So I think there's a lot going on with this um, with this regard. Uh, not that we have any sense of whether or not the couple in this particular poem wanted children. That's not really the point. Um, the point is that that word is in there and we can hear it. Uh, very much. I'm going to go ahead and end the poem and see, you know, the last two uh, stanzas, which consist of two sentences, uh, the shortest sentence of the poem, right, the money is running out. I keep seeing, you know, is and are in this poem, and, and I think that the, the, the to be verb, right, to be, um, to exist, is, is central to understanding this poem as well, and I might look at that later in other, po other, other poems that I read. Um, but the money is running out to me is is a very simple. Um, well, first it's a metaphor, right? Because money doesn't run, and it certainly doesn't run out. Um, you know, but it does have this image of like leaking, right? It's running out. Um, I think of for me that's a that's a liquid image. Uh, maybe it's not for you. I'd love to hear your ideas. But this is like uh, I imagine just like things pouring running out, right? Um, that's the metaphor, that's the image that I see. And it's the money. And I mean, this kind of, I think, goes back to difficulty. I think this goes back to um, just like a domestic issue. Again, like if there's not, uh, you know, having been married for an, uh, a couple of years or a year, or um, not long, but, but <laughs> in these longer term things, this idea, I mean, this is like money is just an argument that you're going to have. It's a, it's just, that's, that's an issue that we're going to talk about. So the money's running out, it's a very domestic issue. Um, nobody's in, faulted with this, if you notice. There's no sense of like, um, like an are you laughing isn't in this one. There's no recrim recrimination, it's, some, it's a simple fact. And of course, if this leads you down a place to like healthcare in the United States and the cost of the cancer of Ewing sarcoma, I mean, that might be interesting for a book like this. I don't really know, right? It could, be, it could bring us into an interesting topic for research though, and talk about how this book sort of exam uh, can exemplify what it means to be um, terminal in the United States understanding. And that actually leads us to another point, which is, um, you know, what is the American culture of death? Like where, where, do we, where do we stand on death as a culture? Um, how do we feel about that, right? What do we think about like, um, how do we approach it? How do we handle it? Who handles it mostly? For us mostly right now, it's hospitals and hospice centers. Like our, our death is um, oftentimes uh, handed over right, to, to others, to hand, um, which there's a lot of research on that, right, that could be really interesting, um, I mean, and I interesting, one of those words I use, not positively, but like, you might learn a lot about who we are as a culture. We will have to split one needle this winter, and that's, that's rough, right, the we here, because we've just seen the we as him and air, um, which, of course, if you know anything about hypodermic needles, right, you get air caught in there, um, in the, you know, in the actual capsule, then, I mean, that's, a, that's death, right, I think that's right, I, that's a, and I know that's really bad. You can't have air in your bloodstream. So that's already problematic, but it's also, that's really sad, right? Split one needle, the needle image goes back to the springs that would have to break their spiral, right? So we're kind of seeing how domesticity is connecting back into the struggle of their lives. Um, the M dash, quick thought, one end for me, one end for air. Um, <clears throat> you know, imagine like a double-sided needle, right? That doesn't really, uh, doesn't really work very well. Um, for, for medicinal purposes. Uh, they're just kind of going back and forth between one another as they share this. Um, and so and again, right, this is living it up for him, is arriving here at the end um, with this image of this is what we can do. We've got to, if we have to split a needle between me and air. If I have to share this body with my own death, if I, if I don't get to be as honest as we can about the love and the difficulty that we have, and if we don't get to hold each other the way that we should, then at least, the very least, this is the best we can do. The poem about carpe diem, the carpe diem, the best you can do. And that's like a fun Latin phrase. Like, I wonder what Latin is for best I can do. And put that at the end of carpe diem. I'll look that up. That could be a lot of fun. Okay, this is a long video. I apologize, but I was trying to get a lot in at once. Uh, I'm going to end this one now, and then um, this will probably be mainly be for today's content, and then we'll build off of this and look at a poem later in the text uh, that allows us to kind of parse this together and see if we can't find it. But again, um, these are my notes, right? Again, it's chicken scratch, but I'm, I'm all over the place because I don't know what I'm going to see later. Uh, I mean, I've read the book, of course, numbers of times, but I'm trying to really find a way into it. So that's all we do. That's our goal try to shave off the time to be able to do that. So thank you. Uh, I hopefully I'll be in touch. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Sorry for the link by now. Uh, uh, email me uh, the word Pixar.
for some extra credit toward a, a quiz. Bye.